All right, so I am now in the loader side of the vehicle, and I wish I had a seat. I, I guess it's just removed from in here, but even that is kind of squished. No, they weren't. Uh, there was no. Uh, there was no, loader no seat. seat. Yeah. It's it corrected. Well, it's swap corrected because no seat. So get the ammo from the bins. The uh, there aren't very many ready ready rounds here. Well, with the Asprom G, they introduced a, a two-round uh, foldable rack, uh, which was uh, loose. So there was a number of those two-round racks sitting around on the floor in convenient locations. Well, that sounds safe. Uh -huh. That's the way they did it. Well, so look at it. So some of the ammunition I see is stowed forward behind the driver. There's some in the whole side here. And there's some in the Sponson sides, mm -hmm. where it's the exact same position that, say, Sherman's kept their ammo. And so Sherman's got this Tommy Cooker reputation. Was there a nickname for the Panzer IV? No, I've never heard of one. <laughs> <laughs> the gun we have a great view of right now, and you've got all the markings. So obviously built 1942 and CXP. What's a CXP? That's the three-letter code that designates the manufacturer. Oh. Each uh, factory had its own uh, three-letter code, and there's a big fat code book that you can look up and find out who made the part. So if a so, part breaks down, you know who to shoot? Uh, well, you know where it came from, uh, and you can go back and you can claim under warranty for it uh, not working. Did, did these things came with a warranty? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> how many thousand miles and how many thousand shots? <laughs> <laughs> these are these are absolutely commercially produced vehicles. It was none of this. This is not state sponsored. They're commercial firms win the contracts and supply the parts, and the assembler puts it all together. Okay. Well, moving back to the gun because that's why we're here, of course. Um, I see a recoil guard gauge with uh, foyer paws. Stop shooting. Yes. Well, each time the gun fires, the uh, buffers heat up and the uh, hydraulic fluid in them deteriorates. After a certain length of time, the gun is starting to recoil further and further. When it gets to the point where that get that marker gets back to four pours, that's the time when they have to stop firing and do something about it. Hmm. Right. The ammunition. So we initially there are 80 rounds of ammunition scattered around this vehicle. Uh, that's what the short, yes, uh, the short ammunition as well as the short gun. Then it goes up when they go to the bigger gun and the bigger ammunition to 87. Yes. How do you do that? Well, they they were a bit more careful in how they laid out the bins around the side, so they got some uh, extra space there. But also they were carrying officially they were carrying these uh, two round that you collapsible earlier. ones that I mentioned earlier. As I move forward, I'm seeing the recu uh, what do you call it? Yeah, compensator. Oh, compensator in German? Yeah. Okay. And so if you look on the outside of this vehicle, the gun sticks out a very long way compared to how short the breech part is. Yeah. And that's precisely so it's a ba basically a big spring. To hold the gun in, in a level position. Okay. To the right of the gun is the coaxial machine gun, an MG34. They started off the Panzer One had MG13s, and yes, they moved sir. to the 34 when? Um, about 1938. Uh, they, the 34 would have been available, but it wouldn't have been in general use on armored vehicles. Um, and. About 1938, they started to use on some vehicles the 30 MG 34s, and then about 1941, they stopped using uh, the drum feeds. They had special 70 round, five round drums, which were not normal outside a vehicle. Right. They were using those up till about 1941, and then they went over to the belted ones with the Gurtzaka with the bags, so they could put a bag with the um, a belt. About 150 or so, yeah. give or take. Right, and last thing is on the right hand side, a lot of vision blocks, I have to say, and another pistol port. So, obviously, you know, pistol ports everywhere there. Uh, I guess they wanted the gunners to use their pistols a lot. Optics everywhere, an optic front right for the loader to see out. It's very, it's very nice of them to put a big optic for the loader to see out forwards as to what's coming at them. But the, the reason they got rid of the one the uh, ports on the front of the turret was actually from an armor protection point of view, you can make a stronger front plate uh, by taking that pistol. Taking the hole out. Taking the hole out. 
and uh, the auxiliary manual traverse, which you have to push in to engage, and then you can help out the poor old gunner yeah, if your motor is dead. 2.6 times the uh, slower than the uh, electric traverse. Right, so I have moved into what I would ordinarily call the bow gunner's position. Some folks might call it the assistant driver's position. Germans, no. They right. call it the Funker. Radioman, which I guess shows the emphasis that the Germans had on radios. I mean, that's, that's very long standing. I mean, uh, where did they learn that? Uh, they, well, they have, they've been experimenting with radios right from the beginning of the concept of Blitzkrieg um, to control large formations of armor. But in fact, because radios were very specialized, very expensive, uh, most tanks only had a receiver. Uh, so until still... this period, 1941 onwards, they started to include a sender as well as a receiver. Three rack here. Um, on the top, you have the uh, sender and receiver. And on the bottom, you have another receiver. So you could listen to both channels at the same time? Yeah. And so would the radio man be primarily responsible for transmitting and taking notes or is he just making sure it's tuned correctly? Uh, well, you know, he's transmitting and uh, receiving and passing the information on the intercom up, uh, back and forward to the commander. I'm a little bit squished in here. The transmission is not up the middle of the axis. They've shoved it off to the right. Any idea why? No. Except to make the poor bow gunner unhappy. Sorry, Funker unhappy. Um, and it is not a small transmission, uh, ZF, correct? Uh, how do you get it out? I mean, you can't put a crane to lift this thing. No, but they had special uh, tools for uh, guiding um, the transmission out through that front uh, hatch. Like jacks and... Yeah, well, you would have split the casing here and taken this part out and undone it up there. You certainly weren't going to be taking the whole uh, aufbau superstructure uh, off. <laughs> Not again. But then there were some tanks that they still had to do that. Uh, yes, there, there, there are ones one. that you have to do that, but you Tiger. don't. Tiger, yeah. Uh, so my big steering brakes are in front of me. Oh, I see this pipe that we were talking about earlier that uh, that takes the, the fumes out. And the machine gun again, another MG34 yes. common system, and he's got an optic of his own there. Yes, yes. Uh, it's a by 1.8, unlike the by 2.5 that the gunner had. And uh, you use your head to aim it, so again, it's a bit like the Panther. Uh, single piece hatch up at the top, and he does have an escape hatch directly below him. And it's not too small, actually. It's um, the size of a good New York pizza, I'd say. There, there you go. I don't know if Germans knew what a good New York pizza was back then, but there we go. 500 uh, millimeter diameter. <laughs> there we go. So there was a lever back here for stowing the radio antenna. Uh, some, of, some of the German tanks I've noticed have a guard on the gun for the radio antenna. And, some, and then all of a sudden it dropped. Do we know why? Uh, yes. Uh, they originally, they... Um were concerned that the gun, the long guns would damage the antennas when they traversed to the right hand side. Um, so the, the extra guard underneath the gun would push the antenna down out of the way because the antenna is spring loaded. But they overcame all of that because they took the antenna and permanently mounted it at the tail end of the vehicle on the left side on a rubber base mount. And that was the end of that? That okay. was the end of that, yeah. Until they ran out of rubber and then they had to have a steel base mount with a spring in it. R rubber does seem to be one of the big uh, sticking points. Major problem. They they had under capacity of uh, rubber and uh, rubber eventually was to be only used for uh, things that couldn't be done effectively without, with any other medium. So gradually they were replacing any uh, uh, wheels that could be uh, like the return rollers could be a steel roller they could get away with that and then they were introducing steel um, tired um, road wheels where there was the rubber was still there but it was inside the wheel where it was protected and lasted longer 
Well, outside of that, as I say, the uh, I suspecting that the seat that I'm in, which is a post-war modification that the, the bond is very apparently thrilling just to keep people happy, uh, maybe, maybe it's health and safety because it's a comfortable seat with the back, uh, is a little bit further back than it ordinarily would be. So uh, my feet are basically stuck, it's a bit like the Panther, uh, in a very narrow section in between the transmission and the steering final drive brake system. Uh, not much else in the radio's position. Uh, we have found one of the little uh, interior dome lights in between there. There is usually a lot more, of course, inside these tanks, but you know, when was the last time you saw a perfectly restored German tank? The, uh, okay, the Panther, granted. Huh? But, uh, <laughs> I, I, I could show you a few of them. <laughs> touche, touche. <Okay. laughs> you probably know where they all are as well, and they all know you. Do you have a uh, yeah, favorite? Favorite? Yeah. What's your favorite German tank? Here. My my favorite one is the Jagdpanther. Why? I just like it. think it's a nice one, but that's the only thing. <laughs> and uh, my ex-colleague, uh, late colleague Walter Spielberger spent his last few uh, weeks before he was captured by the Americans uh, um, in a Jagdpanther. It's a huge vehicle. I mean, look yeah. at it next to the Jagdpanzer, and it's like it dwarfs it. Yeah. But uh, anyway, we, we can come back to Jagdpanzers at, at another point. So uh, we've been rabbiting on long enough. I'm going to have a quick look at the driver's hole, and then we'll be out of here. And finally, the driver's position. This is lovely. Um, I, I had the same thing with the Panzer III. This is a very comfortable and usable position. I am a little bit offset. The hatch is off to the left, which definitely means that I can't drive head out. Uh, but uh, I got the three pedals, clutch, brake, accelerator, two very large tillers, and a six-speed on the right with a reverse. Um, why didn't they do automatics? They did for the Panzer III. Uh, so the uh, Ausführung E, F and G of the Panzer III had a uh, pre-selector automatic gearbox. That's handy enough. Um, the view F, so I got this large optic to my front with the armored shutter and uh, it's frozen in place and a replaceable view box and this well, periscope system. Uh, so I presume you have a periscope here, this slides over to the left. You slide it over to the left and there's a, you've got a binocular optic device. There's two small holes in the top of the front plate there um, through which the uh, periscope operates. It's a KFF2 is its designation and it gives the gunner a chance, or the driver a chance to see out of the vehicle while the uh, vehicle is closed up in combat. So some of the German vehicles I noticed, uh, they went with two small holes in the turret and they went down to one. I presume that was because there was an extra weak point? No, they uh, they uh, redesigned the optics for a single. That was an improvement? Yeah. I mean, okay. Yeah. I mean, you can Originally see, had binocular optics. Uh, the dash is wonderfully simple. Easy to read. There is a green section, which presumably is good, and a red section, which you probably want to avoid. Yes. <laughs> The speedometer, 100 kilometers an hour. The optimistic. Uh, was there a speed record for a German tank? What's the fastest uh, German tank? Well, they w it wasn't a Panzer IV, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> they fell off a cliff. It would, it would have been uh, some of the uh, ones with the uh, rubber tired uh, track, like a uh, half track. So I have another dome light here, just one to my front as well. Uh, fuel tanks, uh, temperature, a lovely simple start and off and an ignition key. I don't know if that was original or not. But it's, it's actually oh, they key. had an, an ignition key, yes. It, it was yeah, actually yeah. a key, so you yeah. had the key to the tank. Yes. Uh, and would it operate any tank? Would it only no, operate no, that one tank? It, would, it, had, it had a little uh, uh, tag on it, which had the uh, chassis number. What did he do if you lost the key? I mean, it's a battle. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't start the tank. I've lost the key. Well, then you run away quick. <laughs> Can you hotwire? Both you from hot both wire. sides, because your own guys are going to be after you. <laughs> so, uh, other things in here. Uh, as I said, well, I've moved over a little bit, so my legs have plenty of room. Uh, manual transmission on the right. On the left, you can see part of the bogey, which comes down and into the uh, the angle of the hull. 
And uh, this is because the bogey is underneath as well. It sort of supports it's more the wave. Uh, reinforcing for the position where the bogey is mounted. Uh, stop it from flexing. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, of course, there is an ammunition rack directly behind me. Uh, as I go around, there is another vision port on the left for the driver. Did that always stay? They didn't get rid of that one. No, they? They, they got rid of that. Once the Schurzen came in, there was no point. You couldn't see That's past the Schurzen. <laughs> and we have a mounting point here for a big circular thing, which I would have thought would be the Speedo, but it's obviously not. No, it's a gyro compass because they uh, could navigate their tanks on it like a, a ship. It'll be handy in the desert. I mean, yes, especially or in, in Russia or anywhere with where there's open spaces. You went on a on a uh, course. You were given your coordinates and your course, and off you went. You know how accurate it was. I mean, obviously it was accurate enough to put it in. Oh yeah, yeah, that, and it's on it's on panthers and tigers as well. And so we have completed our tour around the Panzer IV. Uh, time to close up. But what was the overall opinion of the troops using the Panzer IV? Did they prefer, let's say, oh, I preferred my old Panzer III, it was simpler, or I preferred the Panther, it was bigger? Or? I've never seen any general complaints about it. <laughs> uh, they, but the Germans always produced the Erfahrungsberichte, which were reports about their experiences. So one of the tasks of an officer was to report on what experience they had, but that was always rather detailed. They would say, like the comments about the vision slits and so forth, that we don't use those anymore, so it's a waste of time having them, and uh, there were minor little details like that. Production ran from 37 to 45. Yes. 12, uh, just shy of 1,300 of these G models and 9,000 all told. So that's basically yep. the most numerous German vehicle of the war, uh, armored uh, vehicle. There would have been more Sturmgeschütz, yeah. But yeah, that and, and the Sturmgeschütz are the similar ones. All right, so Germany surrenders. Oh dear, no more Panzer IVs, except they continue seeing service until the 60s. The end of the Panzer IV service life, though, came in Syria, correct? Yes. All right, so 1967, these things are bunkers or are they still mobile and operating? The Czech. Uh, army had uh, at least 150 in service, if not more, but I have details of at least 150 and uh, I have never seen any evidence of anything but Czech ones out in Syria. So they were still functioning around? Yes, and well, they were given new guns because Skoda was making the guns. The guns were being supplied by Skoda anyway. And uh, Skoda went on making the guns, so they got new guns. They got all sorts of minor changes. The track guards get changed to Czech-style track guards and uh, lighting systems and so forth get changed. But other than that, so this is a vehicle that basically had a service life in excess of 30 years. Yes. That's impressive. Well, we'll call it a bit of an end here. Uh, if you're curious, that last Panzer IV that was killed, 10th of June 1967, was ironically enough killed by an Israeli Sherman. Hillary, thank you very much. Thank Been you, Nicholas. Great pleasure. Great. I uh, hope you found this tour a little bit different. Uh, if you're looking for more of the technical stuff, well, okay, I'm sorry, but you can look up a lot of it online anyway. I'll see you on the next one. Greetings! Just a reminder, if you are not yet a player of World of Tanks, the free game, because it's not going to cost you anything to try it out, have a look at the text description below the video here. Download it, try it out, let us know if you like it. That was it. See you on the next one.